Transistors are really cool. Unfortunately, when I was a student, I didn't really appreciate them, but the more I learn about them, the more I build stuff out of them, the more cool I realize they truly are. This is what they look like, three pins at the bottom. In this video, I plan to teach you everything you need to know about a bipolar junction transistor. This will include things like how it operates, what's the basic physics principle behind it, how to build a circuit, deriving some really important equations that will be useful, how it works in its active region, and how we utilize the cutoff and saturation region. If you can follow this video and learn everything that I'm about to teach here, you can solve any BJT problem based on this knowledge. A bit of interesting background about the discovery. I love to mention the guy who discovered it was Shockley. What a name. He discovered it in 1948, so just after World War II. It was based on the work of Braden and Bratton, Bardeen and Bratain. Not sure how to pronounce those two names. But they were basically trying to make something like a transistor, um, but they were actually using a different effect called a field effect transistor. Later, we could be studying MOSFETs, and I'll teach you about that. But they couldn't get the right ratio out. It was Shockley that is officially credited with the final push over the line of how BJTs work. But all three of them did win the Nobel Prize. There's actually a lot of drama behind the whole idea of the BJT and who deserves the credit. Um, so I highly recommend if you have spare time and interest to go ahead and do a deep dive on that. To the whiteboard! There's a lot of important things I want to show you here. Don't be overwhelmed and go through it. Here's a quick revision about how diodes fundamentally work. So just remember we have silicon, on one side we have p-doped positive, on one side we have n-doped negative. We put those two together, there's a bit of transference going on until we create a depletion region. Basically a huge potential barrier that needs to be overcome. Coincidentally, it tends to be 0.7 volts all the time. And here I've constructed a diode in forward bias. However, a transistor is a bit different. You remember in the beginning of the video, I showed you three probes. That's the collector, base, and the emitter. We have NPN type and we have PNP type. For the purpose of this video, I will teach you how to use the NPN type. The reason is because a PNP is just the inverse. You switch the polarity of the power supplies, it works the exact same way. In most things electronics, if you study one method or one system very, very carefully, you are very able to apply that knowledge to all other systems. So this is the general setup of what the BJT looks like. And we have two different power supplies. BJTs operate based on current flow. And that's the difference between it and its counterpart, MOSFETs. I've zoomed in here to show a big story. And this is the part where I'm going to try and explain how it works. First of all, consider this a simple forward bias diode. N, P, and there's the positive port. It's basically just the diode I have over here, if we just don't look at this other mess in this other side. So when I apply a voltage of 0.7 or higher, we activate this diode region here and we have current flow. You'll notice that my arrows are in the opposite way because I'm showing you electron flow here in the zoomed version and we're showing conventional current here. Usually when you're building your circuit, you're going to use this. When I'm explaining physics, I'll be using this because we want to know what the electron is doing. Ultimately, it doesn't matter which one you use. Your maths will actually turn out to be the exact same as long as you're consistent. Blame Benjamin Franklin for the confusion. The basic principle about the operation of a transistor is that if there's the tiniest little current flow here happening, we have very big current flow happening here. How does that work? So as I said, there's a 0.7 volt drop across here and we have current flow. The minute we have electron flow in from the N into the P, the way a classical diode works, we've opened the floodgates. That's the way I tend to describe it. That P junction is really, really thin in comparison to this N doped region. When the depletion layer is gone, when the electrons can overcome that barrier, we have the classical electron flow in this direction and the whole flow in this direction. But because of the excess electron, because this N region is so large in comparison to this P, when you have these excess free electrons here, they're not going to pair up with any of the holes because it's very thin and there's just not enough of them. And so the excess will flow to the positive port. And in fact, the ratio is a lot more favored in this direction than in this direction. A lot of this knowledge is based on understanding how diodes work. So if a lot of this is confusing, I do highly recommend that you might watch a review video on how diodes work. That is everything you need to know about how it operates. In this part, we're going to do all the maths. Don't be terrified. I've redrawn the general schematic. We have a resistor RB. Usually it's a massive resistor. Think about it. We only want a tiny, tiny current here. So how do you limit the current? Shove in a giant resistor in there. This resistor is relatively small in comparison to this dude. And I've drawn it in conventional current. 
You can tell by the transistor, the arrow in the direction that I am doing an NPN transistor with conventional current. That's the flow of conventional current. As I've said, across BE, the base and the measure, we will drop 0.7 volts no matter what. Well, as long as we have 0.7 volts being supplied. I'm going to use loop theory. I think that's what it's usually called. But basically, there's two loops in the system. There's the red one and the black one. We're going to look at the red one. Ignore everything else. The red loop has to obey all laws of physics, including Kirchhoff's laws. Voltage supplied needs to be equal to the voltage dropped across the resistor, which also needs to be equal to the voltage dropped across BE. If you rearrange the equation, we can sub in a relationship for the voltage dropped across this dude. Well, we know Ohm's law. V is equal to I times R. Remember that when we're studying transistors, we can use Ohm's law with resistor behaviors, i.e. this dude will obey Ohm's law and this dude will obey Ohm's law. This dude, mm -mm. this dude is a bit weird. So that is why we need to do maths. We sub in Ohm's law for the voltage drop across the resistor. Rearrange the equation and we have an expression for the baby current, the IB. That's really cool. That means that we're supplying a voltage. We know what it is. We know what the voltage drop across BE is a classical diode. It's about 0.7 volts. And we know what our resistor is usually when we build our circuits. So without even measuring anything, we could calculate what the current is in our red circuit. Next part is we can look at the black circuit, the black loop. Again, Kirchhoff's laws, energy cannot be created or destroyed. All the voltage drops need to equal the source. Rearrange the equation and very, very similarly, the voltage drop across this resistor here obeys Ohm's law. We can sub in Ohm's law in there and rearrange it you know, any way we need, whatever information we do need. Finally, energy cannot be created or destroyed. The voltage across the whole transistor, CE, has to be equal to the voltage drop across BE and the voltage drop across BC. You will never need to learn off these equations because hopefully with a bit of practice and rewatching this video, you will be able to derive them on the spot every time. Beta is what's called a current gain value. Most data sheets of transistors will actually have this value. It's very important. BJTs are used as something called amplifiers, i.e. tiny, tiny current here equals really big current here. So it amplifies the input signal that you have in your system. So IC is the current in this loop divided by the current in this loop. Very, very big number divided by very, very small number equals very big number. Usually these numbers are about 200 to 300 to 400. No unit because it's a ratio value. That means if you get one milliamp here and your beta value is 200, you will get 200 milliamps in your black loop. Finally, another parameter that sometimes some data sheets have is the alpha value. And that is basically an efficiency value. It's the current coming out here divided by the current out here. It depends on what current flow, conventional flow you're kind of looking at the system. The idea behind it is, is if you remember our electron flow, all the electron free electrons are going in here. Some are going in this direction and some are going in this direction. Most of them are going to in the collector direction, but some of them are going in the base direction. If we get the collector one, the one that's going in this direction, divided by all the ones that are going in there, we're going to get a value really close to one, but always a little bit under 0 0.99, 0 0.98, 0 0.97. We will never get higher than one and you pretty much won't get one because then you're just not really obeying the laws of physics. But again, just to bear with me that sometimes your data sheets will not have this alpha value. I've taught you a lot. Let's actually apply everything that we just learned. After all those derivations, how do we actually apply it to a mathematical problem? Well, let me redraw the circuit. This time this is 100 ohms. This guy is 10,000 ohms. Remember, you want a big resistor here because you want to limit that, limit that current. The beta value, that amplification value is 200. And this side of the circuit is operating at 12 volts and this operates at five volts. Classical problem. Let's find the current here, here, and here. And finally, calculate the total voltage dropped across the resistor. You've seen this equation on the last board, but just to quickly explain it, we are just doing Kirchhoff's laws. The voltage that is here has to equal to the voltage drop across the resistor and the voltage drop across BE. But remember, this is just a classical diode. So we're going to lose that 0.7 volts there and only 0.7, ideally. That's where the 0.7 comes in. The five volt is the source voltage here, VBB, over 10,000 ohms, and we get 0.43 milliamps. We can use the classical gain equation which if you remember is equal to the current IC over IB, but we know the gain, we know what IB is now, we can calculate IC from it. 200 times 0.43 milliamps equals 86 milliamps. 
And if you want to calculate what the current is at the emitter here, it's the current here and it's the current here, all added together. This is where the two paths join together and current has to mush together. So it's 86.43 milliamps. For the voltage calculations, again, all the voltage drops have to add up. This 12 volts needs to add up to this guy, needs to add up to this guy. Rearrange the equation to find what the voltage drop is across the collector and the emitter. That's this guy minus the voltage drop across the resistor, Ohm's law, voltage is equal to current times resistance. Our current is 86 milliamps, we just calculated it, and our resistor is given to be 100 ohms. We drop 4.4 volts across the transistor in total. So this is a very typical mathematical question. What else could I possibly ask you? I could ask you what the voltage drop across B and C is, and because you know what the voltage drop is here, you know the total, that would be 4.4 minus 0.7, that's how you would calculate it. There's not much more I could ask you. If you know how to solve this, you know how to solve all of them. The last part I want to talk about is how we can use this as an inverter. So in most of these calculations, I talked to you how it's used as an amplifier. But what's really important to highlight here is that we can utilize the input and output as an inverter. So how do you do that? Assume that the input is this voltage, because that's what we're tweaking, by the way. When we're using a BJT, we're only tweaking the voltage input. That could be a signal that we're reading, it could be a sensor. That's what's really controlling our whole system. And until we reach that 0.7 volts, the switch doesn't activate. This guy, this loop, is always on. It's important to remember that. The voltage source here is always on. And so if there's current flow, we will have the classical ohmic drop across the resistor, we'd calculate the voltage, everything. But hold on a second, what happens if V in is zero? If there's no voltage and there's no current flow happening here. If there's no current flow here, it means there's no current flow here and all the voltage from the source has to drop across the transistor. Another way of kind of seeing it is think of the transistor acting a bit like a capacitor. There's no way the electrons can flow anywhere. They can't flow through the, the transistor. It's an NPN junction. It can't do anything with that. And another way of looking at it is because there's no current flow, no voltage can be dropped across the resistor. It's zero. So somewhere that voltage has to go. This is what we'd like to call the cutoff region, i.e. we're cut off from current. So we start at zero volts in. 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3, 0 0.4, until finally we reach that 0.7 volts. In the moment we reach 0.7 volts, we've activated the switch and now a tiny, tiny current happens here and relatively small current happens here. It's still big, it's 200 times bigger, let's say, but it's still relatively small just yet. However, as soon as there's a current, there's a voltage drop now across this resistor energy cannot be created or destroyed, some of the voltage drop begins to be lost here. And that's why it's decreasing down. Dun, 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 dun. Until we reach a nominal voltage here, i.e. you could keep cranking that voltage more and more and more, which increases this current more and more and more, which increases this current more and more and more, until it stops. Just the laws of physics can't allow you to be creating any more. The, 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 the BJT system, the way there's so many electrons available and so many holes available in the P area and all of that, it can't provide any more electrons. We call this the saturated region. So let me explain how that works. So we've been cranking up the voltage in Vn to the point that it's the maximum, right? No more current can flow. The way I try to teach this as well is by think about the resistor. The resistor, unfortunately, the poor crather has to obey Ohm's law, no matter what. So we keep cranking this current up higher, 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 higher. And V is equal to I times R, the resistor times the current. We've cranked up the current so much that we're almost equal to the voltage source itself. There's no more where the current can go, that we can't crank it up any higher, otherwise we'll be disobeying the laws of physics, Kirchhoff's laws. And usually that's about 0.1 volts is the maximum. There is still some voltage loss and it just doesn't work anymore. Even if I keep cranking this 5 volts, 6 volts, 7 volts, 8 volts, this guy's not going to decrease down in voltage. Our V out is 0.1 volts or almost, almost zero. So as you can see here, it's not quite zero, but it's just slightly above and literally goes off. Usually it's about 0.1 volts. And this is why we can use a BJT as an inverter. If you use the V out, the voltage across the collector and the emitter as your output and your input is the voltage in, you can build a truth table. Meaning that when your input is high, 
your output across the total transistor is low, but if your input is low, your output will be high. And that is how we capitalize on logic gates using transistors. You might ask, well, that's a really cool tool. We should definitely keep it in these two regions. But what is this used for? Well, a BJT is a really, really good sensor. Most of the videos that I make and Twitch streams that I do are actually based on sensor analysis. For example, right here is a water level sensor and it's just basically an open circuit until this sensor reaches water, closes the circuit, and it's ultimately just a BJT. The voltage varies up and down depending on the water level and we utilize an Arduino, for example, to intake the amount of voltage reading using some potential divider set up inside to convert it into code and actual readings. High level of water, low level of water. And that is everything you need to know about BJTs. There's a lot in this video, but I hope you found it ever so slightly educational. Happy studying.